So if I take a look as n approaches infinity, a theta n squared algorithm always beats, eventually, a theta of n cubed algorithm. As n gets bigger, it doesn't matter what these other terms were, if I were describing the absolute precise behavior in terms of a formula, okay? If I had a theta n squared algorithm, it would always be faster for sufficiently large n than a theta n cubed algorithm. Wouldn't matter what those lower terms were. Wouldn't matter what the leading constant was. Okay? This one will always be faster. Even if you ran the theta n squared algorithm on a slow computer and the theta n cubed algorithm on a fast computer. So the great thing about asymptotic notation is it satisfies our issue of being able to compare both relative and absolute speed. Okay? Because we're able to do this no matter what the computer, no matter what the platform. So on different platforms, we may get different constants here, machine-dependent constants for the actual running time. But if I look at the growth as the size of the input gets larger, the asymptotics generally won't change. Okay? So for example, I just draw that as a picture. So if I have n on this axis and t of n on this axis, then this may be a uh, this may be, for example, a theta n cubed algorithm, and this may be a theta n squared algorithm. There's always going to be some point, n naught, where if you go for everything larger, the theta n squared algorithm is going to be cheaper than the theta n cubed algorithm, no matter how much advantage you give it at the beginning in terms of the speed of the computer you're running on. Now, from an engineering point of view, there's some issues we have to deal with, because sometimes it could be that that n0 is so large that you know, the computers aren't big enough to run the problem. So that's why we nevertheless are interested in some of the slower algorithms. Okay? Because some of the slower algorithms, even though they may not asymptotically be slower, I mean, asymptotically they'll be slower, they may still be faster on reasonable sizes of things. And so we have to both balance our mathematical understanding with our engineering common sense in order to do good programming. So just having done analysis of algorithms doesn't automatically make you a good programmer. Okay? You also need to learn how to program and lead, uh, use these tools in practice to understand when they're relevant and when they're not relevant. Okay? So there's a, there's a saying that um, if you want to be a good programmer, you just program every day for two years, you'll be an excellent programmer. Okay? If you want to be a world-class programmer, you can program every day for 10 years. Or you can program every day for two years and take an algorithms class. OK? OK, so let's get back to what we were doing, which is analyzing insertion sort. So we're going to look at the worst case. which, as we mentioned before, is when the input is reverse sorted. So the biggest element comes first and the smallest last. Because now every time you do the insertion, you've got to shuffle everything over. Okay? So you can write down the running time by looking at the nesting of loops. So what we do is we sum up. So we, what we assume is that every operation, every elemental operation, is going to take some constant amount of time. But we don't have to worry about what that constant is, because we're going to be doing asymptotic analysis. As I say, it's the beauty of the method, is that it causes all these things that are real distinctions to sort of vanish. We sort of look at them from, 
from 30,000 feet rather than from, uh, from you, know, uh, you know, three millimeters or something, okay? So each of these operations is going to sort of be a basic operation. One way to think about this in terms of counting operations is counting memory references. How many times do you actually access some variable? Okay, that's another way of sort of thinking about this model. So when we do that, well, we're going to go through this loop. J is going from 2 to N, okay? And then we're going to add up the work that we do within the loop. So we can sort of write that in math as summation of J equals 2 to N, okay? And then what is the work that's going on in this, in this loop? Well, the work that's going on in this loop varies. But in the worst case, how, much, how many operations are going on here for each value of j? So for a given value of j, how much work goes on in this loop? Somebody tell me asymptotically. Yeah, asymptotically is? So it's j times some constant. So it's theta j. Okay, so there's theta j work going on here because this loop, okay, starts out with i being j minus 1 and then it's doing just a constant amount of stuff for each step of the value of i. And i is running from, from uh, uh, j minus 1 down to, uh, down to 0. So we can say that that's theta j work that's going on. People follow that? Okay. And now we have a formula we can evaluate. So what is the evaluation? If I want to simplify this formula, what's that equal to? Sorry, in the back there? Yep, okay. So that's just theta n squared, good. Okay, because this, when you're saying it's the sum of consecutive numbers, you mean what? What's the mathematical term we have for that? So we can communicate. Got to know these things so you communicate. It's called what type of sequence? It's actually a series, but that's okay. What type of series is this called? Arithmetic series. Good, wow, got some sharp people who can communicate. Okay, this is an arithmetic theory, series. You're basically summing 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, some constants in there, but basically it's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 up to n. That's theta of n squared, okay? So if you don't know this math, there's a chapter in the book, or you could have taken the prerequisite. <laughs> Okay. Right? Arithmetic series? People have this vague recollection. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Now, you have to learn these manipulations. We'll talk about it a bit next time. Okay? But you have to learn your theta manipulations for what works with theta. You have to be very careful because theta is a weak notation. Okay? So strong notation is something like Leibniz notation from calculus where you, the chain rule is just canceling two things and just it's fabulous that you can cancel in the chain rule, okay? Just, okay, and Leibniz notation just expresses that so directly you can manipulate. 